Welcome. It's good to see all of you here today. Um, with the dropping case rates and the more people getting vaccinated, we're able to start changing things up. Um, so Rick is going to come and talk to you from the worship committee. We're still easing into it, but we're we're definitely getting back to something more normal. Good morning. The, uh, the worship committee had our meeting last week, and given the fact that the state of California is basically eliminating all restrictions related to COVID as of uh, next Tuesday, uh, we as a commission tried to get together and figure out, okay, what does that mean for St. Andrews and how do we do worship again? And uh, given the, the county has also said that they're going to stay with what the, what the state's guidance is, so there's not any further restrictions from the county. And so we kind of thought about what does that mean? And rather than just kind of jump in and kind of get, you know, go crazy and go like, right back to, quote, normal, uh, we've got a couple things we want to try to ease back into this. And so starting next Sunday, uh, we're going to still keep the roped off pews just to kind of, you know, encourage just a little distancing and such. Uh, masks are not required, but if you're comfortable wearing a mask, I encourage you to wear a mask. If you're sitting in the pews like you are next week, uh, feel free to take your mask off. When you're out mingling among people, you may want to consider putting your mask on. It's your own personal, uh, the county and the state have no longer given guidance on that. So mask or no mask is your call, and either way works for me. Uh, we're not going to pass offering plates. We've got plates at the back and the front. We're going to kind of keep those uh, separate, but we are going to encourage passing the friendship pads again and uh, prayer requests. We want to encourage prayer requests, and so, you know, fill them out, put them on the end of the pew like we always have. Uh, my son is a microbiologist, and he's a big subscriber to the uh, podcast This Week in Virology. And so he's been, he's been, uh, he's kind of geeking out on this whole virus thing. And he tells me that it's less than one in 10,000 cases of COVID have been passed by any kind of contact. It's all breathing. So the fear of contact is not what we thought it was at the beginning. We still have hand sanitizer, but passing the friendship pad in a, uh, uh, prayer requests uh, should pose no risk, and I'm glad to hear of that. Uh, we will do communion. Remember that? Uh, first, first Sunday of July, and we'll try and do it in a, a COVID-friendly, uh, non-contact manner. So uh, bear with us as we experiment how to do that. We do want to get back to adding, you know, uh, passing the peace. You know, and we're going to, instead of calling it passing the peace, it's more like greeting your neighbor, and it's going to be one of those, you know, hey, yeah. <laughs> Uh, still not, you know, handshakes, hugs, and stuff like that. Even as we get into the cold and flu season, it may not be the best idea, but we're going to just start off with the, you know, hey, how are you, rather than handshakes and hugs. Hopefully, as we get further into this and the case rates continue to drop, we can just basically uh, go back to completely normal. So we're going to ease into this. We're going to see how it works. Uh, open to feedback, encouragement, uh, suggestions, all that sort of stuff as we uh, find our way into a new normal. Thanks. It's been a long 15 months. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's good to, to have life be returning a little bit more to normal. I entreat you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to stop allowing yourself to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind as we listen to God's word and pray and open ourselves up to the work of the Spirit. May we be transformed so that we may be truly the living body of Christ in the world. I invite you now to stand and sing our opening hymn, 285, God, You Spin the Whirling Planets.
cooperate with God's work of transformation in our lives by opening up our, our thoughts and our hearts to the Spirit of God. As we make our honest confession, we try and come before God as honestly as we can about our strengths, our weaknesses, uh, where we need to grow, where we can grow. So confident in the gracious mercy of God, let us make our confession. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have always provided for your people, gracing us with many gifts meant to be used for your glory and for the common good. And yet we have not known ourselves or trusted your work within us. Within us are gifts that lie undiscovered, undeveloped, and unused. Grant us the ability to see ourselves as you see us, and free us from the fear that holds us back. For we ask in Jesus' name. We sit before you now in silence, asking that you grant us accurate self-knowledge. Transform our thoughts and prayers. Amen. Please stand for the assurance of pardon. If anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creature. The old life is passing away, and new life is being born each day. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and given a new start every day. Amen.
after entreating us in the first two verses of Romans chapter 12 to offer ourselves to God as living sacrifices so that we might resist being conformed to the patterns of this world so that we can begin to live a transformed life. The Apostle Paul then goes on to tell us in the next verses to think of ourselves with sober judgment. So listen for God's word to us today. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. Just as each of our, one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us, if a person's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. For the word of God here in scripture, for the word of God all around us, and for the word of God within us. I say that every one of you should not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, says the apostle. He is encouraging the virtue of humility. Now, humility, though, is a tricky thing. It's easy, very easy to go wrong. True humility is elusive, it's such a, a fragile plant that the slightest reference to it can cause it to wither and die. When you know you've got humility, well, you've probably lost it. Now, one problem with preaching and teaching about humility is that the people who already lack confidence in themselves, who have low self-esteem and who tend to run themselves down will be the ones who take the message to heart. The danger is that teaching on humility will only confirm them in their lowly, discouraged state. Meanwhile, though, those who feel in control and confident and self-assured will miss the point and reject teaching about humility as pious babble, knowing that humility may be a wonderful virtue but it doesn't help get you waited on in a crowded store or restaurant. Actually, the danger in talking about humility is that everyone misses the point. False understandings of humility abound, and we need to make some careful distinctions. Now, to begin with, in spite of the verbal similarity in English, Christian humility is not the same as humiliation. We have all felt humiliated at one time or another, and it's not a pleasant experience. The journalist Nancy Friday writes that humiliation is perhaps the most persistent of emotions. In time, we forget feelings of passion in the faces of people we loved. We laugh at old angers and rages. Time heals the memory of even physical pain. But old humiliations stay with us for life. They wake us out of the deepest sleep and flush our faces with shame and anger, even when we are alone. Patients with problems of humiliation, say Dr. Robertiello, are the most difficult to treat. Humiliation is so powerful, can it make us wish for our own annihilation? Our very ego shrinks and wills itself for a moment to no longer exist. I felt as if I wanted the ground to open up and swallow me. 
Hopefully you haven't experienced that, that most of us have. And again, it's not, it's not pleasant. Such painful experiences of humiliation do not lead to authentic Christian humility, but just to low self-esteem or to passivity or to crippling neuroses. But humility, says Thomas Merton, is a virtue. It's not a neurosis. Christian humility does not mean thinking badly of yourself. I'm no good, I'm nobody, I'm a failure, I have nothing to offer anybody. Actually, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Humility is not the same as this pernicious psychological habit of running yourself down, criticizing yourself again and again. In a, a chapter for a multi-authored book, my wife Carol wrote this. Um, the mother of one of my daughter's friends approached me one day very troubled. What exactly do you Presbyterians believe anyway? She asked. She then told me about a conversation she had overheard between her daughter and several other 12-year-old girls. The girls were sitting at a table in a fast food restaurant and the mother was seated at the next table reading the newspaper. One after another, the girls expressed disapproval of themselves. They were not nice enough, they were not pretty enough, they were not smart enough, they were not thin enough. The mother listened with growing horror. Finally, she could take it no longer and crash the conversation uninvited. I can't believe you girls are saying these things. You should be proud of yourself. You should feel good about who you are. You should confidently announce yourself to the world. Now, one of the girls, Joanne, in utter seriousness responded, I can't be proud of myself. It's against my religion. Pride is a sin. What religion is that? The mother asked. I'm Presbyterian, the girl stated matter-of-factly, and then repeated her point. We don't believe in pride. Now, the Apostle Paul does clearly say that we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. But that does not mean that we are to think of ourselves more lowly than we ought to. Rather, Paul says that we are to think of ourselves with sober judgment. Now, what does that mean? Well, think about it. The opposite of sober judgment would be drunken judgment, where one's mental faculties are clouded, distorted, and impaired and diminished by having had too much alcohol to drink. That's why you don't really want to get into an argument with someone who's drunk, right? And you don't want to hear them talk about themselves either because they're going to be, it's going to be distorted. But to see the bad in yourself, only the bad, is not to exercise sober judgment. Neither is to only see the good, both are inaccurate. To exercise sober judgment is to see yourself clearly, accurately, and fairly, and actually with some compassion. Because after all, you are only human, just like everyone else. It's to see and acknowledge in yourself the good and the bad, the strengths and the weaknesses, your potential and your limitations, your virtues and your vices. True humility, says Tyrone Edwards, is not an abject, groveling, self-despising spirit, but it's a right estimate of ourselves as God sees us. True humility, adds Ralph Stockton, is intelligent self-respect which keeps us from thinking too highly or too meanly of ourselves. It makes us mindful of the nobility God meant for us to have. And it makes us modest by reminding us how far 
we have come short of what we are capable of being. I like that. Humility is intelligent self-respect. It involves being mindful of the nobility God means for us to have and an awareness that we may be more than we think we are. Now consider these words by Marianne Williamson. She says that our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, she says, not our darkness that frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are we not to be? You are a child of God, she says. Your playing small does not serve the world. We are born to manifest the glory of God within us. It's not just some of us. It is in everyone. And she says, as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give other people the permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our fear, our presence can automatically liberate those around us. The standard, the yardstick we must use to measure ourselves is not each other. If we do that, if you look around and compare yourself with other people, well, think about it. You're either going to be puffed up with pride because you're doing better, or you're going to be deflated with shame because you're not doing as well. And neither of these gives us sober judgment or Christian humility. Comparisons like that are completely misguided. For God did not create us all the same. We are, says Paul, like different parts of a body. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Not just different talents, different personalities, different, different abilities of every kind. The only standard which each of us is accountable to is how we develop and use the particular gifts and graces and experience that God has given us. Before his death, Rabbi Zeusius said, in the coming world, they will not ask me, why were you not Moses? They will ask me, why were you not Zeusia? Each of us is called to manifest the glory of God within us as we are able. Elizabeth O'Connor, who was one of the founding members of the Church of Our Savior in Washington, D.C., believes that every one of us has a good work to do in life. And the good work not only accomplishes something needed in the world, it also completes something within us. When it's finished, a new work emerges that will make green a desert place, as well as scale another mountain in ourselves. The work that we do when it is true vocation always corresponds in a mysterious way to the work that is going on within us. She says that with each new stage of life, a new work emerges in us. In all likelihood, it was there from the beginning, waiting to be claimed, waiting for the development of our personalities and of our gifts. We're probably intended to embark on a new work or a new dimension of an old work every seven years, she says. Think about that. If you're 70, that means 10 times you've taken a new direction. Something new has been born in you. Vocation is always related to those changes that take place in us on our journey toward the freedom to be our true selves, God's word and work in the universe. Freedom to be our true selves. That's what Christian humility gives us. 
freedom to be our true self, God's word and work in the world, that is a high calling indeed. No wonder we need humility. So what is God doing in your life right now? What changes are taking place in you at this stage of your life's journey? What work is God calling you to do? And again, we're not talking about getting a new job, particularly if you're retired. <laughs> what work, what can you share with the people around you? It's not Christian humility, but sin to hide our light under a bushel and to deny that God has given us anything that we are capable of sharing. There are many works that need doing in Christ's church and out there in God's world and in our community and in our families. In the verses I read from Romans 12, Paul mentioned a few prophesy, prophesying, ministering, teaching, exhorting, generous giving, leading, showing passion, compassion, serving. That list is not meant to be exhaustive by any means. There are an infinite variety of gifts and ways of serving. But it is the one spirit, says Paul, that inspires them all. The same breath is blown into the flute, the trumpet, and the bagpipe, or the trumpet and the saxophone, but different music is produced according to those different instruments. In the same way, the one spirit works in us, God, all of God's children, but different results are produced. And God is glorified through them according to our temperament, our personality, who we are. Now, I quoted Thomas Merton before saying that humility is a virtue, not a neurosis. A neurosis blocks the human spirit from meaningful action. Christian humility unblocks and sets us free and empowers us. Merton says that a humility that freezes our being and frustrates all healthy activity is not humility at all, but a disguised form of pride. It dries up the roots of the spiritual life and makes it impossible for us to give ourselves to God. Humility sets us free to do what is really good. A humble spirit is open to God and to God's will. It's open to the gift of life, however life unfolds. And if we've learned one thing in this past year, we can't really predict how life is gonna unfold. A humble person acknowledges with gratitude the gifts that God has given him or her, abilities, achievements, but also keeps in mind the larger web, the relationships that sustain us, that join us one to the other. Alex Haley, the author of Roots, has a picture in his office of a turtle sitting on top of a fence. And he says that the picture is up there to remind him of a lesson he learned long ago. If you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he had some help. Anytime I start thinking, wow, isn't this marvelous what I've done? I look at that picture and remember how this turtle, me, got up on that post. We are all dependent upon God for all that we are. We're dependent on this sustenance God gives us through other people, through the community of faith. And we do know in our best moments that we all fall short of the best that God desires for us. To look at ourselves with such sober judgment can only make us humble. But such a sober look should also make us confident that God does have work for each of us to do and has given us gifts to share. 
As 1 Peter 4.10 says, like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received.
Let us bring all these concerns to God in prayer. God of all times, places, and peoples, we come today so full of concerns, confessions, hopes, dreams, and questions. We came because the world is full of voices and distractions that would take our eyes off of you and your goodwill for us. We came seeking that which is worthy of our trust. We came because you promise us faith, hope, and love. You are a God who hears all prayers and who is working out your will in ways we can't always see or understand, and yet we trust in you. You are also a God who invites our prayers and petitions, for that is how we are called to be with you. So we lift up the prayers of the people that we have named already and the prayers that we hold in our hearts, concerns that you know keep us up at night, worries and anxiety that ground us in our need for you. As we emerge from this pandemic, we ask that you would help each of us to view ourselves with compassion and honesty and to find the places where you are producing new life and growth, where gifts are emerging. Remove from us whatever is blocking the flow of your love and your grace through us. Set us free that we may serve you. We pray now for a wayward world that loves violence and abides inequality that breaks your heart. We pray for a nation in sore need of healing. We pray for mercy and empathy for the one we do not understand. We pray for those in our congregation and families who wait for news of a diagnosis, who are living with health challenges, who care for the sick, and the dying, may they feel your spirit surround, embrace, and encourage them. God, as we prepare to go out from this place, help us to resist being conformed to the patterns of this world. Transform us and free us to use what we have and offer who we are to serve your purposes in the world. We pray all these things in the name of the one who came to show us your love and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our sins, even as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now stand and sing our sending hymn, number 391, and sing it as a prayer, Take My Life.
as you leave this place, go back out into God's world. May you be transformed so that you can be a transforming presence in the lives of others. Trust in God's love for you. Trust in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and trust in the presence of the Spirit in all things. And live your life with courage and faith and generosity and great compassion. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.